Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Treach. I'm Nick McRae, one of your associate pastors here, and it is a, a great joy for me to welcome you to worship today as we prepare to worship our good and gracious God together this morning. Uh, I want to offer a special welcome to you if you are joining us for the first time or for the first time in a long time. And I also want to uh, welcome those who are joining us online. Thank you so much for worshiping with us. We're glad that you're here for, so that we can worship our God together. Friends, we're continuing this week in our worship series, Act, where we are walking through the, the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, to see um, how the early church did things, to see how they were, how they were united, and to see how, what we can, can learn from them in our own Christian lives. Friends, as, uh, as we we're continuing in worship, you'll, if you look around, you'll see there's a a card like this somewhere near you in your pew. And on this card, you'll see several QR codes. You can use these to do lots of different things, but uh, most importantly for now, uh, you can check in and let us know that you're here. It's really helpful to us when we know that you are joining us to worship with us so that we can connect with you. And so if you would do that, check in and let us know you're here. We would really appreciate that. Friends, uh, I'm uh, really glad also that later in the service, we'll be, we're having a guest preacher today, the Reverend Dr. Wayne Lavender. I'll tell you more about him later in the service, but um, I'm so looking forward to hearing him uh, preach on, uh, on a wonderful text from, the text from the second chapter of the book of Acts. Well, friends, if you would stand where you are as you're comfortable and greet someone around you and let them know that you're glad to see them this morning, uh, that would be great. Please join us in singing the opening hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. The words will be on the screen and it's also number 526 in the hymnal.
take and shield me. Oh, we'll find a solace there. Please remain, remain standing and join me as together we reaffirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed. And the words will be on the screen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Friends, would you join me as uh, we go to God in prayer? Let us pray. Holy and loving God, we gather together this day to give you thanks for all of your many gifts, for the gift of life, for the gift of creation, for the gift of your church, for the gift of the people who are gathered here on our left and, and right in front of us and behind us, all those members of your body that you have gathered together in this place to lift you up, to worship you, to lift up the name of your son Jesus and to be filled with your Holy Spirit. For all this, oh God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks, especially for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, who, who came to us and who, who, who bore our sins, who died in our place and rose again victorious over death for us and for our salvation. Oh God, we give you thanks for all of these gifts. God, we, we come together today uh, confessing our sins, confessing that, that we have not loved you with our whole heart, that we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. God, we pray that you would forgive us. We pray that you would transform us more and more every day by your Holy Spirit. Transform us until we become, uh, come into the image of your son, Jesus. Help us to be like him, to love like him, to reach out into the world like him, to to change things, to, to, to heal, to set right what is not right. God, we pray for this power, we pray for this privilege, and, and we take up this responsibility today and every day. And all these things we ask in the name of your son, Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. One of the, I guess you would call it historic, although that, that sounds like a big word for a 35-year-old church, historic support ministries of TREACH is our Stephen ministry program. This morning, we are going to welcome and pray over three of our newest graduates, and as they and their leaders and other Stephen ministers uh, come down, come on down, they are coming down, I want you to attune your hearts to uh, some of the guiding scriptures that support and affirm Stephen Ministries. Philippians 2, 4 says, let each of you look not only to his own or her own interest, but also to the interest of others. 1 Thessalonians 5 says, therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. And Galatians 6 says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. 
I know that we all, in different ways, do this and are about this. But these folks who stand before you have done it in an intentional way, have been a part of a 40-week-long training program that helps them, um, this is my words, not Stephen Ministry words, listen to your problems but not fix them for you. Is that close enough? We are skilled and talented listeners inviting you to find your own answers as you seek through Scripture and prayer God's direction for your life. We are indebted to Marlene Holland and Barbara Carruth for their steadfast leadership. And this morning, we welcome Andy Gappinger, David Ware, and Joseph Moore into the ranks of Stephen Ministers. We have over uh, 25 active at the moment. And if you know somebody who you think, you know what, they need somebody to sit down and have a cup of coffee with, let us know, because one of the things that we most enjoy is serving into that which we are trained for, right? So, Barbara, why don't you give them their, if we would, graduation certificates, <laughs> and then join me, family, as we pray over our brothers. Lord, you have called Joseph Moore, David Ware, and Abby Ga Andy Gappinger to serve in Stephen ministry. God, we ask that you fill them with your Holy Spirit. And in turn, may your Holy Spirit fill them with patience, wisdom, and discernment as they walk alongside, sit alongside the hurting, grieving, and struggling of our church family. God, may they be your agents of hope and healing. And of course, oh God, we ask that you bless their ministry, that it would glorify your name. In the name of our Lord and teacher, Jesus Christ, amen. So these young gentlemen, if they would turn around, I would like you to affirm their decision with a round of applause. <laughs> And 
Hi, Treach. I'd like to thank you for all of your generosity. Your giving supports so many ministries here at Treach, and I'd like to tell you about one of them. The Special Needs Butterfly Ministry is a wonderful place where we are free to explore, discover, and ignite passion within ourselves and grow our faith. We are a group of varying ages and abilities with one unifying commonality, radical love. Here we support and uplift one another physically, intellectually, emotionally, and most importantly, spiritually, as we grow in our personal relationships with God. We challenge each other to be the best stewards of our unique gifts so that we may be blessings to our family, friends, and the community. The Butterfly Ministry is a flexible, slower-paced environment that allows for full inclusion in the church with focus on the joy of knowing Jesus and implementing His teachings in our daily lives. If you're interested in helping the Butterfly Ministry, just let me know. I promise you'll have a great time. To continue to give to the Butterfly Ministry and to support all the other wonderful ministries here at Treach, simply scan the QR code on the screen or text TMUMC to 45777. Thank you. Have a great day. Friends, it's, a, it's an honor for me to introduce our guest preacher for today, uh, the Reverend Dr. Wayne Lavender. Wayne, if you want to kind of start, uh, come and join me up here. Uh, Dr. Lavender is a United Methodist pastor, originally from Connecticut, um, but he's been spending a lot of time recently, in the recent years in Mozambique. As many of you will know, this church has a decades-long connection with ministries in Mozambique. Uh, and to that end, uh, Dr. Lavender is the uh, executive director and one of the founders of the Foundation for Orphans. And this is one of the organizations that we support uh, that uh, opens and maintains orphanages for, uh, for kids in Mozambique. Uh, he's also the author of seven books, I believe. He's, uh, uh, he's taught at universities in, in Iraq and multiple universities here in the United States. And uh, I'm just really excited to hear him bring God's word to us today. So would you welcome uh, Dr. Lavender? <laughs> Thank you. Good morning, Treach. Good morning. What a great church. And I'm so pleased to be here and appreciate the welcome and the invitation and the uh, announcement. I could listen to Nick all morning talk about me. <laughs> and there for a minute, I thought I would. But he kept it short enough. I think you're going to miss him, aren't you? I know next week you'll say goodbye. But you're in good hands with other pastors, too, so... This is the system we live in, isn't it? You, you get the good and the bad, and you've had the good, I think, for a long time. So I just want to thank um, Jackie and her husband, David. Uh, they've kind of been my host today. I didn't realize that David was going to be out there parking cars in this weather. Uh, thanks for the warm uh, welcome to Texas. <laughs> I, I do live in Connecticut again, and, uh, and now you're a, a Stephen minister. So I'm with... Uh, special people in this church, and obviously Jackie as well. So I tell this story. I, I told different beginnings each of my messages just to the people who've come to all two or, two or three. This is a true story. It really happened to me. It happened to me in 2007. You know, sometimes pastors tell stories 
that maybe aren't as true as they could be. <laughs> At least in Connecticut, in Connecticut. Let me put it that way. Okay. So this happened in 2007. You may, remember, you may remember 2007, the wars in the Middle East were not going well, right? There were, we were in Iraq and we were in Afghanistan. There was those bombings every day. American soldiers were dying and so were people in Iraq and Afghanistan. So I got on this airplane flying from Connecticut where I was living to Atlanta. And I sat down next to a woman I'd never met before. Probably you've all had this experience. And we say hi and greet each other, name, where you're going. And then she asked me a, a deeply existential question. She said, what do you do for a living? So I was in transition at the time. I was ordained in 1984 and served churches in Connecticut till 2005. In my last church, I thought it would be there until I retired. I love that church, and we grew dramatically. But I felt a call to work for peace, so I had written my first book. So I could have told her I was a pastor, because I was still a pastor. I could have told her I was an author. I was going up and down the East Coast speaking, so I could have told her I was a speaker. I'd established a nonprofit. I'd gone back to school, and I was earning my PhD. I could have told her I was a student. You know, it was almost like 50 years old. I didn't want to tell her I was a student. That felt embarrassing. So all this went through my mind in like literally a second. And then I said something I'd never said to anybody before. I said to her, I'm a peacemaker. Because that was what I felt like I'd been called to do, was to make peace. So she looked down for like a beat, and then she looked me right between the eyes. And she said, you're not doing a very good job of it. <laughs> and... Uh, I think she meant it to be funny. It was funny. We both laughed. And then I read my book. She read her book. When we got to Atlanta, she went this way. I went that way. I've never seen her again. Although I've been through the Atlanta airport several times, so maybe I did. But I wish I could see her today because I'm proud. And I know pride is a sin, right? But I'm proud to be the executive director of the Foundation for Orphans. And I'm here to thank you for your support and to encourage you as we move forward into the future. So the text that I was asked to preach on this morning is from the book of Acts. And as Nick said a few moments ago, you're working your way through the book of Acts this month. And there was a theologian, I, his name just doesn't come to my mind. I wish I had thought about this before I could look it up. But there's a theologian who said, reading the book of Acts is like, grabbing electricity in both hands. It is just wired. It's like reading through a, a suspense novel that you can't get to the end. So I'd encourage you not only to be here in church as you work through the book of Acts, but to go home and read the whole thing through in one sitting. It's a powerful book. It's an inspiring book. And last week I was preaching at a church in Salt Lake City, United Methodist Church there. There are United Methodist churches in Utah. Uh, and... I spoke on the gift of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, which I think you did as well. And all the church members wore red, and you know we talk about the fire descending on the disciples and the wind of the Holy Spirit coming. So this text from Acts 2 follows that immediately. So Luke writes to us, all came upon everyone. I think it's going to be on the screen. Maybe not. All came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. The word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So it's a pretty powerful text, isn't it? It talks about how after, of course, Jesus had ascended, and the Spirit had been given to them 50 years after the resurrection, how they were gathered together in one place, they were worshiping together, they were breaking bread together, 
but they had sold all of their possessions, given it to the church, and were living together in common. So the word common is actually derived from the Latin word for public. It's public. So we use the word common all the time, don't we? And where I went to college at Drew University, we ate our meals in the commons. They called the dining hall the commons. So we went to the commons and had our meals. I know other colleges have the commons. It was like the student activity place or something like that. In England, they have the House of Commons. That's where the members of parliament go to decide the politics and to set policy for their nation. We have in New England these greens, like you know, all the towns have a green. But they're also called the commons. And that's where people used to sell their wares back in the colonial days and through, through the Civil War era and things like that. People would bring their cows and they'd bring their chickens and they'd bring their corn. Whatever they had to sell, they would sell it there in the commons. There's some words that are also derived from this, like community, but also the word commune. In a way, right, this, this description of the early church, they were almost like living in a commune, weren't they? They had sold their possessions, given them to the church, and they were living together, and the church was growing. They had communion, right? Communion is the one loaf, one body. We all come together in communion. But the word communism is also based on this same root, the same word. Can I say communism in Texas? Right? Am I allowed to say that? Uh, I am not a communist. And in fact, I'm not one who would advocate that we live in communes. So maybe it's a good thing your senior pastor's away this morning because I don't think it's the best thing for all of you to sell your possessions and give it to the church and come live in the, the living center or whatever you call it, right? <laughs> but maybe we should think about that, right? This is the example the early church gave. And this worked for them because they grew like circles in a pond and ripples as the church grew out from Jerusalem through all parts of the Roman Empire and eventually to Europe and eventually across the United States. So how do we deal with that today? How do we think about these things, right? So I'm a capitalist. I believe capitalism is the best way to generate resources and wealth. But I'm concerned sometimes that capitalism leads to some people having too much resources and others not enough. So I have like a little bit of sympathy for socialism so we can spread the wealth a little better without being a socialist. Like how many of you have ever played the game Monopoly? Have you played Monopoly? So how does Monopoly end? It always ends with one person with all the hotels and all the money and everybody else going broke. And somehow that is happening a little bit, right, with unfettered capitalism with these billionaires. You know, $1 billion is $1,000 million? And we have people who have two and $300 billion? But rather than preach on capitalism and communism and socialism, I'd rather speak about John Wesley, founder of the Methodist Church. So here's what John Wesley said about this topic. He said, earn all you can, save all you can, give all you can. And Wesley did that throughout his life. So when he went to college as a young student, he discovered that he was paying money to get his hair cut. So he stopped doing that and let his hair grow out long, like all the pictures you see of Wesley's got long hair, and he would trim it himself when he needed to. So not that I'm John Wesley, but my wife has been cutting my hair for years. And I'm not sure it's such a hard job because I don't have much to cut. But what Wesley did was he saved the money from his haircuts and gave it to the poor. He practiced this throughout his whole life. When he graduated, he became a professor at Oxford. And his first year, he was paid 30 pounds. And he tithed of that 30 pounds. He paid uh, three pounds in, in, in to his church and kept 27 to live on. The next year, he got a raise, he got promoted, he got to 60 pounds. He continued to live on 27 pounds, and that year gave away 33 pounds. And the third year, he got up to 90 pounds salary. He continued to live on 27 pounds and gave away 63 pounds. How many of us have that discipline? 
how many of us could say we did the same thing? What happens to us is as we get raises and promotions, we tend to live up to that level of salary, don't we? Right? We get bigger houses, nicer cars, go on nicer vacations. All of us do this. It's like this trap that we live in. It's this trap of consumerism and buying and spending. And eventually those things that we spend begin to own us in a way. So there was a Methodist preacher who was the chaplain of the Senate back in the 1950s. And he met the senator who came up to him once. And the senator said, Pastor, when I was younger, I used to tithe. I tithed all the time. But now I'm a senator and I have a big salary. I live in Washington. I have a house back home. He said, I have written some books. I do speaking tours. He said, my salary has gotten so big I can't tithe anymore. <laughs> That's ironic, isn't it? So the pastor, Peter Lawry, said, well, will you pray with me? And he said, sure. So they bowed their heads. And the pastor said, Lord God, please reduce this man's salary so he can tithe again. <laughs> it's perfect, isn't it? So what would Wesley say, right? So this is a rhetorical question. Don't raise your hand if you don't want to. But how many of you have vanity license plates? So I looked at getting vanity license plates in Connecticut. They were $70. I didn't do it. I didn't do it probably not because of Wesley, but because I didn't know how to do it. You know, I had to do it online and fill out what you want and pay the extra money. But what would Wesley say? He'd say, don't get vanity plates. Save that $70 and give it to charity. Right? So if we read that scripture lesson as Christians, and we're all Christians here, aren't we? You know, if, if not, you can speak to me after services or speak to one of your pastors. And if you're a seeker, you're welcome here. You know, this is where you come to find your faith and to deepen your faith. But if we're Christians, we have to read this text as seriously as we read some of the other ones. And think about our resources. Wesley spent half of his sermons talking about resources and money. He was, a, he was a radical in this. He showed radical discipleship throughout his life. He gave up tea drinking in his 40s or 50s because he realized he was spending too much of his money on tea. And so he began drinking water. And he said after four or five days, his headaches went away. I guess he had a, a real addiction to tea but after that he didn't spend any more money on tea and he made a lot of money during his lifetime he was very successful he preached throughout england scotland wales and ireland he published his sermons he published hymns that he and his brother charles wrote he translated ancient books from latin and greek into english he was like his own publishing house so on today's standards, he made, in the height of his career, $250,000 a year. So an American who makes that, we'd consider them pretty successful, wouldn't we? But he gave it all away. He died penniless. He died beloved by the people in England, but without any resource, because he gave it all away, a radical discipleship. And here we are sitting in a United Methodist Church, descendants of John Wesley, reading this scripture lesson and think about these things. So I want to use that as the introduction into my work with orphans around the world and show you some pictures, because a picture can be worth a thousand words, right? So the first picture is where we do most of our work. So that's Mozambique in green there. And many of you have been to Mozambique, so maybe some of these pictures will mean more to you. The next is from my first trip in 1998. I want to highlight particularly the girl on the bottom left. She's holding a child on her back. Can you see that? This is childcare in Mozambique. I don't know why I had to go to one of the poorest nations in the world to really experience extreme poverty firsthand and up close. But that's how she was caring for her sibling. These children, and Amy, I'm going to talk about this for a minute so you can switch back to the camera. These children we found at the Telish Orphanage in Telish, Mozambique in 1998. That was built by Carolyn Belshi. Some of you know Carolyn. Did you ever meet Carolyn? Do you know her name? So 
in the early 1990s, after 17 years of war, the church was all of a sudden be given, being given these children as orphans. And Africa then did, doesn't really have a history of orphans because they would care for them in families, in uncles and aunts and grandparents. But the war was so bad that all of a sudden there were all these orphans. So they said, what are we going to do with them? So the church had these buildings that had been a leper's colony that had been abandoned in the 1950s. And these buildings were remote, and they were in the middle of the bush. And Carolyn kind of converted them into an orphanage. She always hoped that it would grow and expand, but what she didn't know it was just up the hill from a swamp. And the swamp, like swamps in Texas and Connecticut, had mosquitoes. Unlike the swamps here, the mosquitoes had malaria. So the kids were always sick and often dying. So when we went there, there were about 25 kids, and one had died the week before we got there, and one died a few weeks later. My church members in a church in Connecticut, we raised $85,000 and moved that orphanage from Tellish to Cambini. We'd asked the director, we spoke to the bishop and the bishop's wife and the UMW people. We said, can we do that? I said, we've been praying for this for years. So we raised the money, we sent it over, and this is how they build construction over there. They, they first did the, the groundbreaking. Then after that, you see the shell of the building going up. And then the orphanage was done a few years later, and our faithful friend, Dudenay, standing in front of it. Some of you, if you've been to Mozambique, you've probably met Dudenay. We built that building for like 10 kids, and within a year, there were 30. We started agricultural projects with Dudenay, so they have chickens. And they started growing crops. So you all know tomatoes and potatoes. And one of my sons, Andrew, is going over. He's planting rice here. Uh, we, we built a bread oven. And now the kids get up early in the morning, some of them, and they start a fire and they make bread and they let it rise. Each kid gets two of those Portuguese rolls. And then they sell the extras in the marketplace. So they get enough money so they can do it again. So they learn discipline, getting up. To learn a business, business skills, how to sell this. Again, capitalism, they get food. That's like one of the best things that we've done. Other pictures continue as we, uh, this, there's another son, Adam, who went there. And they love touching his beard. And the kids, uh, he had a great time there. And, and he took a picture of them playing soccer. They now have a soccer team because they're in the middle of this com uh, community called Cambini. He went north to Dondo. Dondo, there, that's the bishop's assistant in the black robe on the right. There they put a Bible into the ground on those cinder blocks in plastic to symbolize building the home for children, the orphanage on the word of God. And so when I go back there, I've seen this. This picture was from me there this past November. We're about 100 feet from where that Bible was buried in the ground. They still know where it is. They still go there. We can still see that the orphanage was built on the word of God. As, uh, as was said by Nick, I also taught and worked in Iraq from 2011 to 2013 after I, I got my PhD. Iraq has a million orphans from the war. Mozambique has a million orphans from poverty. This is the first class I taught in Iraq. These students were learning peace and conflict resolution. Then I established a chapter of the Foundation for Orphans in Iraq. And here I am going around. We went to several different locations where there were orphans. I'm playing a game with these kids. On the stage behind us are students of mine who helped me organize and set up a chapter of the Foundation for Orphans. This next boy asked me if I would be his father. And that's a really hard question to be asked. And I told him I would be his friend but I haven't seen him since 2013, so it's been a while. I train these students to be mentors for orphans in Iraq. Is that the next picture? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm out of order. Uh, I had the opportunity to go to a, a refugee camp, and it had snowed a few days before. I went there in December, so it snows in Iraq. Can you imagine that? I didn't know that before I went up in the mountains. But these are the tents that people came and lived in. And this is how many people were living in the tent. That's me on the right, but there's two more on the left. These people left all they had to live in a tent in Iraq 
where it snows in winter and in summer I saw 122 degrees. This young woman named Yvonne, her parents had both been killed. She had lived near, uh, uh, and I'm drawing a, a senior blank, anyway, Damascus. She lived near Damascus. Her parents had been killed. She walked with her uncle and aunt to this refugee camp that snow around her feet. This is what war does. War creates orphans. There's more orphans today because of what's happening in Ukraine. There's more orphans today because of the pandemic. They think 7 million more orphans because of the pandemic. So I trained these students to be mentors for orphans in Iraq. And most of them, their kids have aged out. I need to go back and see if we can resurrect that program again. They're all Muslim. Guess what? The Quran tells its followers 22 times to care for orphans. So if Christians and Muslims would follow our scriptures, we could take care of all the orphans of the world. I have some questions for you after that introduction. How many times does the Bible tell us to care for orphans? So my flight's at six tonight. So I've got a few more hours. Uh, and some of you have heard this already, and so you know. Some of you came to two or three services, but the answer is 30. 30 separate times the Bible tells us to care for orphans. That's more than any other group in the Bible we're told to care for. Often it's, a, it's linked with caring for widows, often care for orphans and widows and sometimes strangers. But the Bible tells us 30 times to care for orphans. So as Christians, we should be caring for orphans. So who said these words? Care for orphans is the highest form of charity on the planet. Mother Teresa. People always guess Mother Teresa. That's a really good guess. I, I've spoken in so many Methodist churches and rarely does anybody know. But I'll, I'll, I'll give you the hint and you can all say the answer at the same time, okay? The hint is you're sitting in a United Methodist church. John Wesley. How come we don't know that? How come Methodists don't know that John Wesley said caring for orphans is the highest form of charity on the planet? Because we're not taught it, right? And why did Wesley say it? Because he knew the Bible better than all of us combined. He knew it in, he read the New Testament in Greek. He read the Old Testament in Hebrew. He wrote books about the Bible. He did commentaries on the Bible. He knew it said 30 times to care for orphans. And he had orphans in England at the time. He wrote that letter to George Wedfield when he said that. So if you're a United Methodist, you should be caring for orphans because it's in the Bible and because Wesley said it, it's in our DNA. It is in our DNA. But we've, got, we've gotten away from it. So somehow, some way, I want to thank you for your support and encourage you to do more. I have brought with me to Mozambique on the same trip, Democrats and Republicans. Can you imagine? <laughs> I brought with me rich people and poor people, black people and white people, young people and old people, people who believe one side of the sexual identity schism and some on the other. You know, United Methodist Church is about to split. You all know that, right? We would have split a couple years ago except for the pandemic. We're splitting because we can't agree on sexual identity. But I brought people on all sides of these issues and if we work all day, eight, 10 hours with orphans, these differences we have, they fade in importance. We no longer fight. We don't fight over policies. We don't fight over health care and who should be the president and whether or not we should be ordaining gay and lesbian men and women and allowing same-sex couples to get married. We agree that orphans are the priority and we become friends and we love each other. We build the... We build a beloved community, like the Book of Acts talks about. So we've got some more slides. I sort of cut away from them. I never know where the Spirit's going to take me. This is our plan for our new homes for children. We call them homes for children, even though they're basically orphanages. Each of those cottages on the top right in pink hold six to eight kids. We want to build six to eight of them. That, that plan is for more, but we may eventually grow. Down at the bottom in pink is the dining hall and the, and the uh, education room, and green is fields. 
We have a five-acre site that's been given to us in Manapo, Mozambique, another site in Sango, in addition to the ones we already have. The next slide shows the, the uh, cottages themselves. So on the left is the common room, the community room, right? Here's that word again. And there's two bedrooms on the right. Each of those bedrooms would have two cots. So four kids living in the top right, four kids living in the bottom right, a bathroom in between. We can put eight kids in a building like that for $6,000, $6,000. So how much does the average home cost in Dallas or Flower Mound? I didn't look up Flower Mound, but the average home in Dallas costs $321,659, at least according to Google. Um, I think uh, Zillow says it's closer to $400,000. And how many people live in the average home in this area? The answer is 2.6. So we can build a home for eight kids for $5,000. That's like 1 40th of what average house costs here. Think of John Wesley, right? Earn all you can. Save all you can. Give all you can. Then the next slide should show what we've done in Mozambique. So those are homes for children that we've built or in the process of building. And the next slide shows what we've done in sub-Saharan Africa, either ourselves with the Foundation for Orphans or with our partners. All these are on our flyers that you can pick up on the way after church or on our website. My friends at Treach, thank you for all you've done. I hope I've inspired you to think of the future and what else you can continue to do. The reason we're living in the midst of this pandemic are difficult and hard to explain. But there's 150 million orphans around the world. 16,500 die every day. We can mitigate that. We can be the church, not only treats, but the denomination that cares for orphans. And when we do that, I promise you, your church will continue to grow and to flourish. People will flock to your church. You'll be able, when people say, what church do you go to? I go to Treach United Methodist Church, and we care for orphans and vulnerable children. We're making a difference. We're saving lives. We're doing what the Bible tells us to do. What could be better than that on this hot Sunday in June? Grace, peace, mercy, and love. And, and, and we want to thank you as well for your, for your continued generosity. Uh, it's because of uh, the way that you give and your generosity to your church that we're able to continue supporting a foundation for orphans and lots of other ministries in Mozambique and elsewhere. I'll talk again uh, just toward the end of the service about how you can continue to support uh, specifically foundation for orphans. But uh, I want to thank you for all of your generosity. And if you'd like to give or like to begin giving, you can just go to tmumc.org slash give. Um, you can also text your donation. There's the, it's on the screen here. You can text TMUMC to 45777. But however you do it, uh, we give thanks for, um, give thanks to God for your generosity. They're holding up the ladder that I'm climbing on. I'm climbing up the ladder and I'm going home at the top of the ladder. Oh, what joy there will be. And the angels are holding up this ladder for me. up the ladder that I'm climbing on, I'm climbing
climbing up the ladder and I'm going home at the top of the ladder. Oh, what joy there will be. And the angels are holding up this ladder. Join us in our closing hymn. The words will be on the screen. Just a closer walk with thee. Walk with thee. 
my plea Daily walking close to Thee Let it be, dear Lord, let it be When my feeble life is o'er Time for me will be no more On that bright eternal shore I will walk, dear Lord, close to Thee Just a closer Daily walking close to Thee Let it be, dear Lord, let it be Let it be, dear Lord, let it be Friends, as we're preparing to, uh, to, to go forth from this place, uh, first, uh, it's always a joy to welcome new members into the life of the church. And so we have uh, five new members we'd like to welcome. We got Sandra Holt and also the Wright family, Greg, uh, Dawn, Rebecca, and Nick Wright. Uh, what a joy to welcome them. So if you see them around, welcome them. And let's, yeah, let's... Let's give, let's give uh, the Holy Spirit a round of applause for, for bringing new members into, uh, into our family. We're, we're so glad to, to welcome them. Uh, Wayne, would you come and join me up here, please? So thanks to your generosity, friends of uh, TREACH, uh, we are able to offer this check for $10,000 to the Foundation for Orphans. So I'm gonna hand this over to Wayne. Thank you, thank you for your... Uh, for your faithful generosity, you, you have uh, help, helped us be able to do this. But just because we've handed him over this check doesn't mean that we can't make even more impact uh, for our Lord Jesus Christ in, uh, in Mozambique and, and elsewhere uh, through Foundation for Orphans. So if you'd like to, and I would love to see us give even more. I'd love to see us, uh, especially if you felt the Holy Spirit working within you as you heard these stories and, and, and seen these pictures of what's happening in Mozambique and elsewhere. I hope that after the service, you'll come and, and, uh, and, and meet Dr. Lavender. You can go, you know, there's a table out there. You can also meet him there. You could write a check to the Foundation for Orphans. You could go to their website or um, you could go to Treach, Treach's website, uh, tmumc.org slash give. When you look under missions, you'll see a tab that says uh, sponsor an orphan. Every dollar that goes into that sponsor an orphan um, tab will go directly to Foundation for Orphans to continue their work. So I hope that you'll, you'll search your heart and see what we might be able to even further bless those folks, those orphans uh, through, through that. So once again, thank you so much, Dr. Lavender, for being here and sharing this word. And uh, would, you, would you bless us as we go forward? Yeah, so already Nick has told me he, he'd like to have me come and speak at his church. That'd be great. And I'll, I'll come back here if you'd have me. Um, I'll be looking at you. My wife has been watching the services online, and I love it when she travels with me, but she has a job too, and she couldn't come this week. But she said, you will never cut my hair. <laughs> I'm looking at you. Probably I shouldn't, right? Probably I shouldn't. So uh, one of my board members says to me, he's a salesperson. He says, Wayne, you're not a good closer. You know, closers close. He's a salesman. He says, you got to get the money. You got to get the deal before you leave. But I don't think that's my job to be a closer. I think that's the work of the Holy Spirit. So if the Holy Spirit has spoken to you, I hope you'll do any of those things that have been recommended. On the table outside where Jackie is, she's going to be leaving in a minute. We have these flyers. These are for free. Pick one up. There's annual reports. Pick them up. 
they're free. There's a copy of my most recent book. They're like $15. This is like beginner, intermediate, advanced. <laughs> right? The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And blessings of God Almighty, Creator, Word, and Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Be good disciples.